Now, my hi, my, and welcome to this uh, Facebook Live chat uh, all about the vaccine ahead of Super Saturday, where we are going to try and get as many uh, people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, vaccinated as possible. First jab, second jab, uh, doesn't actually matter. And on that, actually, while we're talking about jabs, 83% uh, of the population, the eligible population, that is, uh, have had their first jab as of today. That's a great number. And 59% of the population have had their second dose as of today. That's over 6 uh, million doses out there. Now, we are here uh, to get that even higher. We want to go way higher than that. Uh, it's a COVID challenge that we are taking head on on Super Saturday. And I know and everybody knows that there are still lots of people with questions about the vaccine. And we have got a team of some of our best Kiwis and some of our best experts actually uh, here tonight to take some of your answers. And I'll start by introducing them. Uh, and a man actually that doesn't need much introduction whatsoever. Nigel Ladder is here. Nigel, welcome. And Nigel is, of course, a trained clinical psychologist. Uh, he's worked for over two decades. I thought it would have been many, many more than that, but that's what I'm told here in forensic psychology and, of course, uh, in family therapy. And he is one of our most well-known and trusted uh, psychologists and, in fact, well-known and trusted New Zealanders. We also have uh, Dr. Maya Brewerton, who is, uh, well, she's from Ngāti Pro and Ngāti Kahanunu, but she's also a clinical immunologist, immunologist and allergist and an immunopathologist, all hard words to say, but all very important things uh, when it comes to talking about the vaccine. Uh, welcome, Maya. Kia ora, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Helen Petusis harris is a vaccinologist at the University of Auckland with 23 years experience in vaccine-related research, and her special interests are, of course, uh, vaccine effectiveness and vaccine safety. Welcome, Helen. Kia ora, everybody. And if we could just begin, actually, uh, I'll give you 60 seconds each. You can do it. Uh, Nigel seemed to reckon before we came on here that he could do it a lot quicker uh, than 60 seconds. But if each of the three of you, uh, and before we do that, we'll also welcome uh, Scott, our interpreter, and Donna, our interpreter, who we've got here. And isn't that going to be great? Um, but if we could start with you, Nigel, uh, within 60 seconds at least, are you fully jabbed and why did you do it? Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I've had my uh, I've had my two two doses. Uh, real simple. I'm 54, and I didn't want to die. Like it's <laughs> that simple. I just thought, uh, you know, you, you just you, you just even a cursory knowledge of of what's going on. So yeah, like 54, uh, like not have it's it's interesting that I've had lots of vaccines over my life. Never really think about them. When I got the second vaccine, I felt this huge, like huge sense of relief. Uh, so yeah, it's like real simple for me. Didn't want to die. <laughs> good reason. Helen, can you can you do it quicker than him? You seem to reckon you could do it pretty quick as well. That's pretty well, good I reason. I can do it really quick. Uh, like, like Nigel, don't want to get dead, but also really don't like COVID, don't like the idea of long COVID. Don't want to be part of the problem, want to be part of the solution for my, you know, myself and my whanau. So that was important. And uh, as a vaccinologist, I, I have to admit, I was pretty excited about this new vaccine and it was a cathartic moment um, getting that done. So that's my reasons. Yeah, and Maya, what about you? Why did why, why did you get vaccinated? Yeah, all of the above. Definitely don't want to be dead either. Um, I an immunologist looks after some of the most vulnerable patients who have um, an immune system that cannot protect them, and I think that it's my job um, to care for those people. And I think me getting the vaccination is just part of that care that I provide my patients, but it is about my family. Uh, definitely, you know, my pop and my mum, I want to protect these people. Um, and I really do want to protect the people down at the supermarket because, you know, I work at a hospital and if you're going to meet anyone with COVID, it might be me. So I really don't want to be someone who, um, who spreads it in the community. Yeah, I know for me, it was just such an awesome feeling to get the first jab, but the second jab in particular, and that's that feeling of actually uh, having done my bit uh, for, for everybody here in New Zealand was just awesome. And I've got to say, you know, I've had heaps of vaccines for when I'm traveling and everything like that. And I, I honestly, I can't even remember what they're for, what I did, where I got them, uh, except that I've got a little piece of card somewhere saying that I've got them to get into some country or whatever. This was totally different. This felt like being part 
of history and I love the feeling and I love uh, being part of communicating uh, to people who, who, who are on the fence or wondering what to do about why we should do it. And we'll start by doing that by asking Nigel, in your capacity, you're an expert on families, you're an expert on all of these dynamics and everything like that. Nigel, how can we support or how can we help a family member who is nervous about getting the vaccine? What, what can families do, Nigel, in that situation? Um, and the most, the most important thing is that we, we, we got to, we, we just got to not, we just got to be, we got to be gentle with each other, right? No one, no one, people are hesitant about getting the vaccine because they're afraid and that's pretty normal. It's, it's, and the kind of in the context of the world that we're living in right now, it's pretty normal to be fearful about things. And so no one ever changes their mind because someone lectures them or goes on at them or treats them like an idiot. Yeah. You, you change your mind if someone sits down with you and listens to your point of view and asks and you know and ask you questions and answers your questions. And so the most important thing is we just we just gotta have conversations with people. Part of what happens when we're afraid is that brains aren't just one big blob. They kind of, there are different departments who do different things. So if we if we think something's a threat, it gets passed down to kind of our limbic system for that more fighty flighty stuff. Um, what we actually want is to be making decisions up in that cortex stuff at the top. So it's important to be kind of thinking calmly about that stuff. And the way that you think calmly about stuff is that you have to, you have to be able to trust the, the the people that you're getting information from. And I think a large part of the problem for people right now is that if you start digging around on the internet, um, you could dig for miles. And there are endless people going, I've done lots of research on this and blah, 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 blah. Um, it, what you have to do is make sure that you're getting the research from people that you trust. And for me, I get lost in all the stuff around protein spikes and this, that, and the other. I, I just look for simple, big numbers and for me, um, the stuff that helps me to make the decision is those simple, clear, big numbers. And, you know, we've got experts who will talk about that stuff, but it's about finding a big, clear kind of bit of bit of evidence that, that helps you to feel calm. And, I, and, and if you're hesitant, don't look for us. Don't look for an answer that's going to make you feel completely relaxed because you won't. Right. If you're worried about it, you're probably going to be worried about it the whole way through. But you can't make decisions based on worry. You have to make decisions based on the evidence and based on this clever stuff at the top of you, not that deeper brain stuff. So that's what's great that, you know, more <laughs> people who know things about vaccines so they can answer some of those questions. What happens though, Nigel, and you know, and I'm hearing this a lot in that inevitable kind of breakdown between friends and families when there, there, there's an impasse with someone who, who doesn't want to get vaccinated. You know, what do you do in that breakdown? How do you keep those relationships, whether it's your brother, your sister, a cousin, uh, uh, someone you're working with, how do you keep those relationships intact in that situation? Yeah, it's, you kind of have to have an intention to do that in the first place. So I spent 20 years sitting in rooms with people trying to find out why people were doing one thing and suggest they might be able to do something else, which, is, <laughs> which would be more helpful to them in the long run. And the thing that I learned from all of that is it's it's all about relationship. It's about being calm. It's about answering people's questions. And it's about doing that in a non-judgmental way. I'm as guilty of this as anyone. For the last 12 months, I've been going around the country doing talks. And I had I would I don't use the term anywhere anymore, but I would talk about anti-vaxxers and kind of make fun of people. Now, given the stakes are so high, I deeply regret that. I wasted 12 months where I basically just alienated people instead of actually saying, I get it. It's okay to be stressed about this stuff, but don't let fear make your decision. So it's kind of not doing what I did, which is making fun of people or getting into arguments with people. People are just people. We're all trying to do what we think is best and how we make those decisions is when we feel calm and reassured and when someone can answer all of their questions. And that's why Evenings like tonight are so important. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. We'll get on to the others in a, in a moment. But you're saying you you regret uh, making jokes about anti vaxxers yeah. You you, re yeah, you regret yeah. it, Nigel. It was just dumb. Like it was a dumb thing to do. And do you know what it was? It was like it it felt. It, I didn't. It's it's like all of that stuff felt like it was still a long way away from being a big issue to us. But over the last few weeks, as I finally, you know, you kind of see that. I, 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 you just hear people, you know, people who are saying, I've, I've made a decision not to get, not to get the vaccine. And, pe you know, women who are pregnant saying, I've done the res research and I've made it. 
that stuff, it just, it just tears at me because I just think find someone who you trust, sit down and talk to them before you make this decision. Don't make the decision based on other, other people who are anxious who will just back up, who will just stoke your fear and uncertainty because that's going to make you um, much less likely to get it. So yeah, like I, I've wasted 12 months where I could have been saying to people, it's, it's actually okay to be scared about the stuff. It's okay to be anxious about it. And you're not going to find an answer that will make you feel completely relaxed. You just won't. So you have to abandon that idea. What you have to do is find someone who you trust, who can give you information that you trust. And then you have to make a decision on the basis of that and not the fear based stuff. Anyone who's trying to stoke up kind of fear, not just giving you information and some other stuff it's just numbers it's just things that we count you know we just look at the last few months how many people in the latest outbreak uh, are, are vaccinated who've been infected and how many are unvaccinated big numbers like that that's just a number of people so that kind of stuff is clear so yeah you just gotta you, you just gotta you just gotta pause the anxiety and the fear and just find some people that you can trust find people who actually know things not not people who've done research um and then, and then listen and evaluate what they're saying. Yeah, well, great. Well, we've got people that actually know stuff uh, right here on this Facebook Live, and one of them is Maya. And Maya, a big question. It's, it's not actually directly relevant to me, but it is one of the big questions around the vaccine. And it, it's, you know, how does it impact on, on, on someone's menstrual cycle, their pregnancy, their fertility? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, tell us about that. How does the, how does the vaccine impact on that? Yeah, look, I want to start with the group um, that I think is feeling the most worried out there, out there at the moment, and that's our pregnant woman and our hapu mama who are trying to make a decision to protect their baby. And when we're talking about that, I really do understand, having had my own children, that you really don't want to get this decision wrong. And so I think for pregnant women, it's very clear that if you get COVID-19, it is a far more severe illness in pregnant women. They are four times more likely to end up in intensive care. Um, they are more likely to have a preterm baby. And so we have to understand when we're making the decision of what it means if we choose not to have the vaccine and we encounter the virus. Um, early on, I think uh, we didn't have all the safety data for pregnant women that we have now. And it's very clear that this vaccine is uh, for pregnant women safe to have at any stage during their pregnancy. Um, it doesn't affect your fertility if you're a young woman thinking about your future. And uh, I wouldn't have given it to my own daughter if there was any biologically plausible way that that could be the case. Um, so I think it's really important. I think women's menstrual cycles vary anyway, and I don't think that that data is clear. Um, so I do think that you may see variations. We know that women's menstrual cycle can vary if they're unwell for any reason. So. I, I guess it's just about making sure that when women are making these decisions, they balance it up with the risk between the virus and the risk between the vaccine. Okay, excellent answer. Now I'm going to bring you in now, Helen, because when we've gone out for questions, obviously we're getting lots of questions about the potential for adverse reactions. And we all know there's a whole range of potential uh, adverse reactions. Can you give us an overview of what they are because they do happen and and some advice on how to deal with them okay so i i guess when it when it comes to um adverse reactions i, I sort of separate them out um because some of them i think aren't necessarily adverse so maybe we'll deal with those first and then maybe we could um talk about the things that i think probably strike fear into people um, and that's the things that could be more serious so in terms of the, the reactions that we get that are quite common, um, they're, they're all associated with your body making an immune response. Um, they're common to, to um, pretty much 
most all, all vaccines that we that we that we routinely use. So um, definitely a sore arm. Just about everybody will have some degree of sore arm, and 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 that's related to to the influx of of, uh, of of cells coming there to gobble up the vaccine and and this inflammation and it's sore. But a while later, you can have these. Um, these other reactions that are like like a bit, bit like you're getting the flu, um, things like a fever and a headache. And, and people, I think the most common one is feeling really tired. So um, again, that those are all symptoms of an immune response. And if you feel grotty the next day, that's usually what's going on. And you should feel better the day after that. So I guess that, that constitutes the bulk. Um, and then there's the things I think um, the, the, the idea that there could be these other serious things. Um, and we, we look for these serious things and we monitor for them after the vaccines have completed the trials um, in a number of different ways after the vaccine comes into use. Because this gives us the opportunity too to look for very rare things that don't turn up in the clinical trials uh, using uh, what we call big data, for example. And so there's a whole lot of different approaches to doing that. And I think people can get fixated on what gets reported um, spontaneously or, um, you, you know, pe people making reports about things that happen after. And what we need to do is look to see if we're seeing more than we would normally expect of these things, but also, also do lots and lots of work to see if there's a difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated people to tease all of this out. So using a whole lot of approaches like that, we come to conclusions about the safety of the vaccine and, and if there's any rare things that um, that we should be aware of. And what about myocarditis? I know a lot of people ask about that. We see a lot of commentary around that. Tell us about the risks around that, please, Helen. Mm -hmm. So using all this big data and, and all these different approaches, we've detected that there is a an increased risk for this inflammation of the heart, um, and myocarditis and also pericarditis. And, um, and so this is this has appeared, and um, and because we're looking at so many people, and the risk of this is um, really skewed towards um, young guys, um, young males aged um, aged from teens through to about thirty, um, where you see most of the risk, and that is following the second dose. Um, the cases that happen after the vaccine are almost always very mild and um, and resolve um, and, and resolve quite quite quickly. Uh, so there's a lot. Um, there's some cardiologists that have got a lot to say about that. They're really worth listening to. Um, and uh, and the risk of that happening is about 70 per million in the highest risk group. Um, for the rest of us, for most people, the risk is more in the order of about one or two per million. So it's very, very rare. We do expect to see it. And, um, and the thing to know is if somebody does feel like they have the, you know, some pain in the chest and, and symptoms, to, to go and see their doctor. And, um, and you know, early treatment is, is, is really good. So just if you've got the disease, um, you can also get myocarditis and it can and, and it will be much worse. It can be very severe among all the other potential complications. So so the risk um, the, the risk benefit, you know when you weigh it up, it's very clear that it's um, that it's actually super important to get the vaccine even for these higher risk people. And Maya, is there anything you want to add there with your with your expertise? Oh, look, I I think it's really clear um, that this is a risk of the vaccine, you know. Um, but what is also clear from the data is that the risk for these young men is much higher from the virus again. And so we've got data out of Israel that shows that it's significantly higher. And so again, coming back to what Nigel said earlier, you know, when you're talking about this risk, you really have to um, for, you have to think about all of the risk, not just of the vaccine. And I think we uh, too often people focus on just the risk of the vaccine and not the risk of the virus. And here's something that all three of you can can come in on, and we'll we'll start with you, Nigel. You know those people out there with underlying health conditions. Um, obviously, they, they they need some expertise as well, but some of it will be mental as well, Nigel, which is why I want to start with you. Someone who has an underlying health condition and maybe despite medical advice saying go and get it, they're still worried about doing it. You know, 
what do you say to them if they're worried about getting vaccinated? Starting with you, Nigel. Yeah, I think it's really important to, like, this is, this is such a big deal, and it's so important that you can't just let your brain automatically make decisions without you having some oversight in what it's doing. And so what we know is that if you are, um, if you are stressed and if you are anxious and if you are depressed, then you tend to make different kind of decisions. And so what's really important is if you are feeling kind of worried or anxious about getting the vaccine, you just have to accept that that's actually normal and there's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the vaccine. It just means that you're in a context of the world at the moment where there's a whole lot of scary stuff floating around. Um, so again, it's about not thinking I have to feel completely relaxed before I get the vaccine because you 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 almost certainly won't. What you have to do is, is you have to decide, okay, am I going to let those kind of those anxious, those kind of fight or flighty, more more primitive for want a better word, parts of my brain make the decision, or am I going to be calm and let my cortex make that decision and and so that's about kind of listening to the things that we've been hearing so far so you know you hear the myocarditis stuff and you go whoa like that's a little bit scary that's your limbic system going that's scary the cortex stuff is the whole risk thing so your cortex stuff is saying okay there's a risk of that with the vaccine it's this but the risk of it with covid is like it's like this <laughs> So if we put those two things together, there's a little bit of risk, like what is it, one in a million or something, 70 in a million, um, versus uh, the, the 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 number of people who get myocarditis if if you have the vaccine. And so like again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, but that's that's what you have to do. You have to listen when people like these guys are talking and not react from that limbic system fear-based stuff, but really pay attention to the information and the big numbers. And so if you're already feeling a bit anxious about it, as soon as you hear some of these words, you'll start to feel more anxious. You just recognize that, you take a breath, you stop and then listen to the whole thing. Maybe go back and watch this again, um, you know, the, the recorded version of it and, and really logically kind of lay out the information. We're not good at making rational decisions. We're not good at making logical decisions. We tend to make a lot of emotionally based decisions this is not something that you should make an emotionally based decision about. This is something that you should stop and just pause and just calm yourself a little bit um, and make a decision based on that information. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm finding you very soothing, uh, actually, to listen to Nigel, just to might, you know, put you on loop at some point because um, you, really, you really are a soothing individual. Thank you so much. Helen, what does the big picture tell us about underlying health conditions you know for those people out there who are worried what 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 is the big picture uh, when it comes to the vaccine and underlying health conditions in terms of safety there's no indication that there are any underlying health conditions that might lead you to become more at risk of having uh, a reaction um, and certainly there's a very, very long list of, of conditions that place you at greater risk of complications from the, from the virus. So again, um, I think that, that that risk assessment really does skew in favour, um, in particular for this group, in, in, um, in the vaccine being a good idea. Yeah, so basically COVID is, more, is, COVID is going to be much more likely to be bad for you if you've got an underlying health condition than than the vaccine is. Simple mm -hmm. as that. Simple as that. Yeah, you're nodding there, Maya, as well. A message mm -hmm. to those people who are worried? Yeah, I think so. I think for those people, um, there are a few health conditions where the timing of the vaccine is important. Um, and I think that's what I want to frame for people who have underlying health conditions who are concerned about it and under a specialist perhaps at a hospital Certainly, if you're having cancer treatment or, or other immunosuppressive treatment, we might change the timing of your vaccine to get the best effect out of it. And I certainly think the cardiologists, if you have active cardiac um, heart inflammation, um, would advise the best timing for you to have the vaccine. So what I would say to people, it's less about who can't and can have it, and it's more about the timing of it is really important. Now, let's talk about kids, because kids under 12, as we know, um, 
cannot have the vaccine at the moment. And a question has come in, you know, someone is wondering how does or does the vaccine protect our children from having it? This is probably a good one to start with you, Helen. Does the vaccine protect our children from, you know, how does the vaccine protect our children from us having the vaccine, if that makes any sense? Have I asked that question right? <laughs> you look like you're wondering. Yeah, I, I, I'm, how, I how, how, I'll, I'll do it one more time. I'll do it one more time. How does us having the vaccine protect our children who can't have the vaccine? Uh, by us having the vaccine, we reduce our ability to transmit the virus. Um, it doesn't necessarily stop us. Um, and uh, some people will still be able to transmit the virus, but it reduces it overall. So if we're all um, doing that, we're helping to cocoon our children who, for whom the vaccine's not yet available. Yeah, and you know, do we know how much it slows it, how much it suppresses it? I guess that just mm -hmm. seems to me to be one of the one of the main criticisms that that I see yeah. personally is people saying, "Hey." fully vaccinated people are still transmitting it. So what's the point? There's a spectrum. So, um, and it changes over time. So so once you're recently uh, vaccinated, you um, are pretty good at not getting infected, um, even, even against the Delta, Delta variant, although some people will still be able to get infected. And then, um, and then the people who've been vaccinated that get uh, that do get infected uh, transmit that virus for a shorter time um, than an unvaccinated person. So there's a few things going on there. But over time, as our antibodies um, start to decline, even though there's lots of other good stuff going on in the background, but as our antibodies decline, um, our ability to, to not get infected um, declines. So we, we can, um, we're back to being, you know, at risk of getting infected, even though our immune memory kicks in and stops us from perhaps getting sick. So that's going to be a thing over time. And that's one of the reasons that some, um, you know, some countries are now looking at um, at booster doses, and I mean that's probably another discussion. But um, but yes, it's a whole spectrum, and overall, these vaccinated people are less likely to transmit. Okay, okay. Maya, is there anything you want to say on that? Yeah, look, I, I just do want to make it clear that early on, after being vaccinated, you're significantly less likely to get infected. And I guess what some people don't understand is when we're talking about transmission, we're only talking about those individuals who've already been infected. And so if you take out all the individuals or add in all the individuals who didn't get infected in the first place, then those numbers look far more um, reassuring. But Helen's absolutely right. You know, um, early on after you've been vaccinated, these antibodies are there, ready to go. And that if they neutralise the virus, they can stop you getting infected at the point of entry. Um, but those may not be immediately on hand from your immune system uh, uh, as time goes on, but your immune system can still fight that virus, but um, it'll get cracking once it gets into your cells. So it's just understanding these numbers that they're different in different phases after you've been vaccinated. And Nigel, I'll bring you in on this topic because, you know, in terms of communicating with people, and that's, that's what, what we've been talking with you tonight, you know, what do you do when someone says, well, what is the point? Because I can still pass the virus on. Uh, if you're engaged in some sort of debate with a loved one or with someone you know who just says, hey, people are, people are passing it on, it doesn't actually stop you from passing it on. What, what, what's the counter argument there, Nigel? Yeah, I think what it's about is, is you just have to be informed about the basic facts of this thing, right? And, and, and when you're talking to people, it's about trying to put it to them in a way that, that kind of resonates and connects with them. So, you know, when, you, when I hear people talking about things like, you know, the virus is looking for um, unvaccinated people, like it's kind of hunting them out, I that's kind of, it's a pretty freaky and scary kind of idea, but it's, but it's true. Um, and so when you're, when you're, when you're talking to someone who says, well, you know, what's the point? I can still get it on, get the, get the, you know, I can still pass it on. My thing is, it is about those basic facts. And sometimes I'm saying to those people, yeah, okay, but, but you won't die. <laughs> like you just bring it back to really simple things. And you say to people, the, you know what we know about the the about the long term effects of COVID. This is a really terrible, 
terrible thing to get. You talk to people who've had it. I mean, we've got friends in the UK and we've talked to people. Who've had it. It's a terrible thing to get. The long-term physical effects, the long-term kind of psychological effects, cognitive effects. So I think what's it about is when people say that kind of stuff, you just have to be, you just have to kind of pay attention to the stuff that Maya and Helen are talking about and be able to have those things that you can talk to people about it um, and, and just help them to make it. In some ways, I think the problem here is we've been so protected from it. Um, for us, we've, you know, the, the first lockdown kind of worked and so it's felt like something that's a long way away. Um, you only have to, you only have to, you only have to, Go overseas and 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 look at what people are going through. You know, you look at kids who can't get into hospital for an appendix operation because they're full of the ICUs are full of people who've got COVID. You have to kind of make people get. Look, it's not it, what you're doing is it's about protecting yourself and all of the people around them. Help help them to connect it with the vulnerable people in their life. Like you you have you have kids. You've got older people in your family. You've got people with um, health problems. Like that's that's what this is about it's about all of us providing this kind of as much as we can protection for ourselves but but all of the people around us okay and helen i just want to pick up on something you said before because we have been getting a lot of questions uh, about the booster uh, and people saying hey look when can i when can i get my third vaccination you know what do we know so far about whether we will go there with boosters and and what will happen with that for those people out there that actually um, they want another jab, uh, some of the people who are watching, which is great in some ways. But what, what can you say to those people who are saying, jab me again, uh, Helen? <laughs> In time. Um, I think what we've, what we've learned, we're learning lots at the moment, is um, I guess, first of all, um, do they work and do we need them? And so in terms of do they work, um, a, a booster dose given several months later, like at least six or eight months later, um, results in a glorious immune response um, and results in immunity that is um, superior to what you where you peaked after your um, after your second dose. Um, so that that that's behaving like um, you know most of our favourite vaccines, I guess, that we routinely use. And the, those antibodies are likely to be sustained for longer than perhaps what we see after our first two doses. So do they work? Yes. Um, and also, are they effective? data from Israel who, who implemented boosters um, sort of quite early. Well, you know, they're, they're, they're further down that, that track than a lot of countries. Um, yes, they're showing themselves to be very, um, very effective and also reducing transmission. So do we need them? I think there's some people that um, that will need a third dose very early in particular, um, and I'm sure Maya can say more about these people, but organ transplant um, people, for example. Um, perhaps those that are more frail um, and are not, not as immune competent as us young people. Um, and, and then moving into the general population. So I think that's something that we can, we can see in time um, when it's needed. But I think diverting, particularly if you're going to divert resources into um, into giving people boosters, um, I think would be a mistake when we, we still work to be done on our um, getting our first doses away. And also ensuring that, and perhaps I'm thinking more globally here, but, but um, ensuring that countries that haven't got a single dose in at this stage um, have access to vaccines um, before uh, populations um, who are well vaccinated get onto their third doses, aside, um, of course, those special groups aside who, who probably need one much earlier. Okay, and thank you, Helen, for calling us young. Uh, just then I did notice that. That was very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Maya, but what, what, what do you think about the third dose or the booster? There are people that need it by the sounds of things. Yeah, I think um, the immunocompromised group, we do have some data there showing that that's probably going to be one of the first groups that we consider here in New Zealand when we do consider it. Um, but I always highlight too to my vulnerable immunocompromised patients that actually um, even a booster may not boost them up to protective levels. And we talk about a sort of protective wall of vaccinated people around them. And so I support what Helen's saying in that we want to get all New Zealanders double dosed just so they can be the protective wall around our 
very vulnerable. And then when we have all the data, um, and we're lucky in this country that we are, we can watch from overseas and decide what's the best approach and for whom. Um, so I just want to say, if you're concerned about these people and, and um, boosters, I think the best thing to do is help build as big a wall around them of as many vaccinated people as possible to keep them safe. And here's one that a lot of people ask, uh, you know, is there any difference in the experience of different ethnicities in terms of their reactions? Is there any truth to that, that different ethnicities have different adverse reactions? Maya, uh, I'll come to you on that. Yeah, I haven't seen any data to suggest it. I think, um, interestingly, with anaphylaxis or the severe allergic reactions after vaccination, which are also rare um, and occur in about one in 200,000 people, that is actually far more likely to happen in women um, than in men. So I think there is some interesting data out there, and I'm sure Helen will be um, au fait with all of these. But I think in terms of that, that's a really important to think about uh, the immune response that can be different in different genders. But overall, I haven't seen any data to tell me that this vaccine is less, in, less effective in different ethnicity groups. Helen, is there, any, is there anything out there um, showing us that there are differences for different ethnicities, being an adverse reaction or, or the effectiveness of the vaccine? Uh, we're on it. Um, from the trials um, for this vaccine, they did have a, 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 a spread of, of ethnicities um, and there was really no difference between ethnic groups in the from the trial data. Um, but now we're in the real world, we're able to, to look at this more carefully. So um, that's one of the things that, that my team and I are doing. So we don't have an answer for you yet, but um, we will be looking. Okay, and here's, an, here's another interesting question, and, and th this is the kind of thing that people do ask. Uh, does the vaccine contain animal products? No. So what's in it for this person who's asking that? Um, fatty acids and um, the, the all-important little, um, little piece of messenger RNA. Yeah, so I, I guess what this person is wondering is what actually is is it is it in when they put it into your arm? You know, we know we know sort of what RNA is, don't we? But but what's actually in the vial? I guess is what this person's really getting at. Right. So in the vial, of course, there's mainly water to you know um, for injection. Um, in the vials, there's a little there's the wee strand of of of, of instruction. Um, encoded in this in this little piece of messenger RNA, and it's sort of encased in in a little sphere of these little little fatty acids, and it keeps it it keeps it safe because the little RNA molecule is very fragile and um, won't last long um, unless it's got some protection. And this little bubble, uh, I guess, the little sphere or nanoparticle, it's called, um, of fatty acids is taken up very nicely by the cell. Um, and then once these things are taken up, um, they, are, they, are, they disintegrate, they are recycled, for example. So after, um, over a period of days, um, hours to days actually, that what was injected really ceases to exist. Yeah, and Nigel, with questions like this, that to, to some people, you know, they seem, you know, why is, how can someone not, you know, how can someone not know this or how can someone be wondering what's in it? You know, how do you deal with these sorts of questions or people who seem to have, you know, got a lot of misinformation or, or unfounded fears? You know, how, how, how should you deal with this when you're communicating with someone? You, you just kind of have to find really simple ways to explain stuff in a way that people can get. And, and part of the problem, of course, is now we can all go online and we can Google stuff, we can go on Facebook and you can follow this, you can spend a thousand years following this stuff around Facebook and the debates and people will sound um, really uh, emphatic in their claims about what this thing is um, and, and, you know, this, that and the other. It's, it's about, for me, I'm not great at remembering a whole lot of complicated... The reason I didn't become a doctor is because they have to know stuff. And I thought, oh, it's not going to work for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, these guys know things. Oh, psychology is kind of about having opinions about stuff, and I can do that. Um, 
Yeah, so, well, well, you're talking to a journalist here who knows know, even right? less, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. I'm always super impressed with people I didn't even, I didn't even start stuff. thinking about a doctor. I didn't even start thinking about a doctor, so at least you did. <laughs> so, so for me, like, because I'm not great at remembering a whole bunch of complicated stuff, um, I, I just have to find really simple ways of understanding it. It is about really simple things. And so, you know, when Helen was talking just before, I went, oh, okay, that's cool. So they inject this stuff and inject the RNA into your arm. They kind of wrap it up in a little thing to protect it. And basically, uh, within, you know, hours to days, that thing is gone because it's, it's like they just put something in your arm temporarily that makes your immune system go, hang on, something going on over there. Um, and then it starts making stuff to help us. So that, like, I hadn't ever kind of heard it explain like that. And nah. now, I, now, I, now I kind of get it. It's like, okay, they put a thing in, it's wrapped in a thing, your but immune system There's goes, a lot of Whoa. water, a, there's a lot of, a lot of it is actually water, isn't it, Helen? Yeah. It's going in there. And it, and, yeah. it, and, it, and it makes stuff and, and then it and then it disappears because there's a lot of stuff go out there about you know injecting DNA into you and your DNA changing and one of the things I hear a lot from people is it's experimental like I hear that a lot hey, from well, people let's, it's yeah well let's vaccine. let's bring in let's bring in the other yeah. two experts about the experimental side of things because that is something that I hear a lot as as well how can we know the long term effects of something that has been made up really really quickly and how can we trust governments and all of this sort of stuff that have sort of put this on us when it's just literally been invented because that's what a lot of people say how can we really know know the long-term effects maya what do you think of this this question what do you say to that? oh there's so much in there i think the first thing i want to point out is um this isn't coming from governments um the recommendation for this vaccination is coming from doctors like me um scientists um and i think that's really important to remember this is a health decision and i want to remind people of that um so let's get back to your actual question <laughs> um, how do we know it's safe and i think we always need to look back at history so over the last 60 years um we've given people all sorts of different vaccines. And as Helen was explaining, it's a single dose that's put in your arm and then quickly uh, your body clears it away. And so if you are going to have a serious effect from a vaccine, we would expect to see that within two months of you being vaccinated. So it's really important for people to look back at the history of vaccines to understand the long-term safety um, and I know that a lot of people feel like mRNA vaccines are new. Um, for me, I think they're beautiful. Like it is beautiful science, but it isn't new. So scientists first vaccinated, um, I think it was a mouse back in the 1990s uh, with this type of vaccine. And so they've actually been in clinical trials for decades. So I think it's important to remember just because something feels new to you, doesn't mean that it is new to the world of science. Yeah, and I think that's really important what you've said there, Maya, is that the mRNA vaccine is not new. The Am I right in saying that the COVID version of this is new? Is that is that what you're saying there? Yeah, but it's been given to hundreds of millions of people like we've never had a vaccine like this watched and interrogated in this way i certainly think helen should jump in now here as the expert in this area but you know you i think if you're thinking about waiting i feel like you've waited long enough like we've got so much data now so much safety data yeah, Helen, Helen, what do you want to say about that to someone who's saying, I want to wait, I want to see if there's some long-term effects? And I guess they'll be saying, well, I've seen what it's been doing for a year, but I want to know what it's going to do to me in five years or two years or, or something yeah. like that. What, 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 what do you say about that, those people that are worried yeah. and are waiting? I think I'd try and get to the bottom of what it is that's really worrying them because um, I think Maya summed it up beautifully. Um, there's really no biological uh, way that, that things could pop up in a decade. Um, and we know that from our experience. And we are watching intently. And yes, I think when, when we think about actually experiments, we're still experimenting, if you like, with the smallpox vaccine. We experiment with every vaccine we can get our hands on, really, uh, for the entire life of the product. And we keep studying it. Um, and through all of this, we know that that is um, 
is extremely unlikely. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying there, aren't you, is that, you know, experimenting um, is, is science. That's how things get developed. Nigel, is that what you'd, is that, is that what you'd take from that, Nigel, that, that, you know, to someone who is saying that it's, you know, quote, an experiment? Yeah, and that's it's one of the frustrating things sometimes when you're talking to people and you don't like, so I'm not an immunologist or a vaccinologist, and when people say it's experimental, I know that's not true, but I don't have at the top of my head the information to kind of rebut that. And so now, <laughs> thanks to Helen and Mark, that well, actually, these things have been around since like the 1990s, and actually every virus, every vaccine is experimental in the sense that people study it over the entire time that we're giving this stuff to people. And so it's... It's having that kind of um, having that kind of information there is is like this is super interesting for me. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's 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 actually really helpful because the next time someone says to me this is experimental, we're going no, like we've been doing this this thing for decades. Like this particular one is 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 new, but this type of vaccine has been around since the since the nineties, and it's experimental. But that's what scientists do. Like they. We, we, we put a vaccine out there and people study it forever as long as we're giving it to people and the information builds. And the one thing we know about this particular one is there's been a lot of people looking at this <laughs> very closely for a long time now and there's a huge number of uh, vaccines been given around the world. Yeah, and I, I, I'm actually, I'm with Nigel because I'm finding it super interesting too, even yeah. though I've been doing heaps of reading and stuff on it myself. And just to, just to come back on on that issue of you know some sort of biological side effect that may that we may not have seen yet, are you basically saying Helen or, or, or Maya um, that we'd no, that we'd know by now that there's no sort of history of vaccines having some great big problem um, one two three ten twenty years out into the future? Does that does that just not happen? Is that a, is that a myth? There, there is one. There is one exception. But when we talk about a, a longer term, we're not talking about years and years down the track here. We're talking actually relatively short. So we, um, it's something we would have expected to see. But we also, um, we also did the, you know, the due diligence before we actually put it in humans. And we've seen this with. We see it sometimes with various types of infection, and we see it. Um, we have seen it. Um, with um with with some in particular experimental vaccines but we have seen it with vaccines before so we know we know about it we know what to look for and that's this phenomena where you can um where, where you can actually end up with a with a if you got infected you could end up with an enhanced disease and we see that in in nature quite a lot so one of the things with vaccine development is you want to rule out those possibilities and by understanding how that happens you can um you can do that through um through you know all the work before you start putting it into people or your animal models or that work and then once you start putting it in people you look specifically for it um, and any signal or any sign that this could possibly happen and um if this was going to happen we we it's again it's something we would have seen uh, we would have seen by now so again extremely unlikely but that is the that that is the one exception yeah Maya maybe bring bring you on on the same question as well I mean would we have seen? Um, some sort of adverse reaction by now um, if there was going to be one? Yeah, look, I think, Patty, we have seen adverse reactions to the vaccine, and I'm really honest and clear with patients. You know, we've talked about some of these tonight. We've talked about you can have an adverse reaction like myocarditis or uh, a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis. So, yes, those adverse reactions um, can occur, but... We know what to look for now, and I think that that's very clear from the data. And it is about just um, being, making sure that you understand that risk relative to not being vaccinated. Yeah, I guess I guess the question is, you know, is there something else that could pop up? Is what people are wondering mm -hmm. about now, you know, beyond what we've already seen. <laughs> I really don't think so, you know, um, and I think it's important. I know people worry about all sorts of things. It's in our human nature, isn't it? Um, that we're inherent worriers, are we, Nigel? We worry a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and particularly now, right, because one of the things about, uh, about COVID and lockdown, there's just uncertainty and stress all of the time, you know. So one of the reasons people feel so kind of are finding this hard is that we're having to deal with this constant uncertainty of 
when we're going to be in lockdown, out of lockdown, there's lots of businesses that are in trouble, parents have got kids at home. So we're all kind of stressed and anxious and worried, and that's just looking for something to attach to. And that's where I think sometimes it gets hard for people because this anxiety just attaches to the to, attaches to the wrong thing and, 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 it, and it, it makes them hesitant about doing the one thing that would actually make them and their families safe. Well, here's a, here's a um, great answer, Nigel. Now, here's a, here's a pretty practical question, um, probably for you, Maya, actually. You know, someone out there is wondering, where does the needle go? We, you know, and this is this is a bit like this question earlier of people were wondering what what was in it, and you know, where does it go? Does it go into the vein or does it go into the muscle? Where where does the needle actually go? Yeah, it's a good question. I have to admit, I haven't given a single person physically the vaccine myself. Um, we have amazing staff who do that, but I do know where it goes. Um, it goes into the muscle. So the needle um, goes into the muscle, and it's really important. Um, that we administer it in a site where the immune response can then um, activate and the cells there can take up the mRNA and your immune response can then build from there. So that muscle is usually this muscle up here in the top of your arm. Um, but for some patients, if they've had surgery or other reasons that it can't be administered there, um, we can use other muscles too. <laughs> Great. I'm just pleased to know that I that I've actually still got um, a, a muscle up there, so that's good uh, from my perspective. So that's kind of equally up there with being called young before um, that, that it's a muscle up there. That's great. Um, can I just um, can I just give my little vaccination hack here? Because yes. don't do what I did. I went along wearing like a button-up shirt and like numpty, and so of course they well, have to, it off. They have to you, put you, it. Yeah, you're like you're basically I'm in dressing in the car. Like I'm just having and and then clearly there'd be lots of numpties like me before because I unbutton like I unbutton two buttons that you said, no, you're gonna have to do four. Like you, it's it's definitely and she was right, four was just right. So wear a t shirt or something like okay. that, or like me, yeah. you're gonna be unbuttoning. Not, not, and you're gonna not, do four not, buttons. Nigel trust me. Nigel letters Nigel letters I mean it's not really a hack, uh just keep you it's a way of keeping your clothes on in public, but uh, that's yeah. if you want to call it a hack, you call it a hack. I'm going to call it a hack. It's my vaccination <laughs> hack. Bit of a vaccine hack there. I think you're right, Nigel. You just definitely got to dress for the occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk about um, let's talk about children, and I'll bring you in here, Helen. Um, lots of questions about about children, and one of them is, what does informed consent look like for our twelve? to 15 year olds who are getting the vaccine. So someone someone out there wants to know, you know, what is informed consent for, you know, say someone who is who is 12. I mean, how do they how do they, you know, how does informed consent work there? Actually, I was just listening to to some experts on that on that today because um, actually young people can actually make their own decision on this if they if they choose to and if they want to go to a vaccine centre, um, the the vaccinator can assess that they are quite capable of understanding the information and everything and they can actually um, give them you know give themselves informed consent if you like um, certainly for for those who are 12, 12 and over. Um, so that's kind of what that can look like. Um, does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Maybe Maya's yeah. got something to add to that. And yeah, Maya, look, well, I, yeah. yeah look, I, I come think, in, Maya. Um, I don't think any of our vaccination centres would race in or try to pressure a 12-year-old if they showed up asking for the, the vaccine. I, I want to reassure parents out there that it's a very careful and considered consent process and in no way would they want to feel that a child had been coerced into getting the vaccine. And so if a young person did show up, I think they would be very um, need to be very clear that they did have a full understanding. But I want to, I guess I want to reassure parents that um, that's a careful process. Uh, it's not just a child walking in and saying, I want it. That's not sufficient to meet informed consent. And Nigel, this is your area of expertise. I mean, do you think that could be uh, an issue for young people and for families out there where a, where a 12 to 15 year old uh, is maybe doing it because um, they've come they've come to to their school at some point, or, or their parents want them to, and they don't want to. What what would happen in this scenario, Nigel? 
I think I think what it's about is we can, we just have to trust that actually the people doing stuff are just good people, and they are right. So there's a you know it's like Maya was saying that and, and Helen was saying they're not just going to you know kids are going to roll on they're just going to go boom and go on. Someone's going to sit down and talk to a twelve year old and go okay so you know what's 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 going on. You just have to you, you have to kind of I think we have to trust the fact that actually the people doing this are responsible and professional people and. And they are, you know. I was, I was thinking that just as we were talking before. It's like, you know, when I went in the, uh, to both times, you know, for the first one and the second one, I was just super impressed at, you know, these are people who were just working really, really hard, and they had just endless people coming through. And my partner's daughter was a little bit anxious about the, you know, the the needle part of it. Um, they were just really lovely. They were just like really, really nice. They weren't like bang, 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 get everyone through. They were chatty and friendly and nice. Um, and so, you know, my experience of kind of a health system in this country is that we're just blessed with a with a pretty good system, and the people working in it are pretty much universally good people who want to do the right thing. So I'm I'm I don't I'm not concerned about it. I actually trust that the people on the ground doing this stuff um, are going to be guided by you know what's a responsible and ethical and the right thing to do. Yeah, and very quickly because we're close to close to wrapping up now. But one for you, Helen, and and I'll come to you on this as well, Maya. Uh, before I get some last thoughts from everyone, under 12s, Helen, starting with you, when do you think and do you think um, that under 12s will be able to get it? And obviously understanding that MedSafe would have to sign it off and that kind of thing, but what are your thoughts on the vaccine becoming available for 5 to 12-year-olds in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, if MedSafe approves it? Possibly by Christmas. Um it looks like in the US it'll be in about November, so um, we shouldn't be too far behind, is my crystal ball guess. Um, and then, and then they might look at perhaps delivering it, um, you know, in other ways next year through schools, perhaps. Yeah, and Maya, what what are your thoughts on that for those parents out there um, of five to twelve year olds? What are your thoughts on whether it'll be safe um, for those children um, should it become available before Christmas potentially? Yeah, look, I think we will follow the process that we've followed all the way through. And if the science shows that it's safe and the science shows that it works, then um, a very uh, skilled group of people will review all the data and make sure it's the right decision for our kids so that parents at home don't have to um, go through all these different studies and try to figure it out for themselves. So. I think we will just continue to follow the science and um, it's a watch this space, but it does look like it's on the horizon. Okay, and now uh, any last advice, uh, 30 second answer each this time, I won't give you 60 seconds, you didn't need it uh, at the start, any of you. You know, what, what, what little nuggets of information, 30 seconds each, uh, starting with you, Helen, uh, a little bit of, bit of advice for everybody watching. I think um, I think that a lot of science has has shown this vaccine to be um, remarkably safe, incredibly effective, and is certainly supporting that that this is our way out of our um, out of our lockdown um, and back to the normality that we we desperately desperately crave. And, it, and it's a, a really good way to keep our whole community. We're all in this together. It's it's not just about you know just not about me and just about you, but it's about all of us. And uh, and I think if we you know um, I think we can do this. Great. And Maya, your your thirty second piece of advice <laughs> for anyone out there with 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 anyone out there wondering yeah. a little bit more but after this. I guess mine's a little bit different. I think um, I really do believe in the science behind this, but I don't want the decision to be divisive in this country as it has been overseas. Um, this is a health decision and we need to put everything else aside and make a decision based on our health. Um, and remember that we are one big team. You know, I don't want this to be a divisive issue. And I don't think we should make any assumptions about people who have chosen to have the vaccine or who have chosen not to. Great answer. And Nigel, 30 seconds. Give us, give us your best shot, bro. 
Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the same. Like I, I, I think it's important that we don't let this thing divide us. I think it's important that we don't get impatient or unkind, as I have been uh, with people in the past. I think it's important that we kind of we talk to people and give them information. You know, Maya and Helen have given people not opinion but kind of facts. And so, if you if you have been uncertain. Think about the stuff that you've been hearing tonight. Maybe watch the thing again. There's some some really key parts of information in this. Um, and, and then make a decision. But when you make a decision, um, try to make sure that that decision is coming from that calm, wise part of you and not from that anxiety and fear-driven part of you. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, just okay. I hope you do. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant advice. My only advice really is to you, Nigel, try and keep your shirt on uh, in public. Actually, I don't care whether you do or not. Uh, you do you. Um, <laughs> when it does come to that potential booster. Uh, listen, I'd just like to thank all three of you and, of course, Donna and Scott, who've been interpreting uh, as we head into Super Saturday. Uh, there will be another one of these on Saturday, actually, for people who want any more information or have got any more questions. The Ministry of Health is going to be running one of these again. And if you've got... Uh, any any more questions or things to look for? Look to trusted sources of information like it, like the Ministry of Health or or, or news media organisations like the ones that the one the one that I work for. Um, other than that, focus on Super Saturday. Stay safe. Uh, let's try and get those numbers up. Shot, bro. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone. See you.